yeah, good morning, everyone. Before uh, we are going into details, I would like to uh, give a brief overview about evolution and natural selection. Because we, you know, we are always talking about that, but I'm not sure if everyone is really aware of what it really means. So basically, a parental generation generates an abundance of offspring. That's always the case. So if you have other insects like flies, they will uh, create hundreds of eggs each summer, and only two of these offspring individuals have to survive to ensure that the population is stable. All the others will be subdued to natural selection. So whether they have the wrong color so that they can be seen by the birds or they are not fast enough to, uh, yeah, to evade being fed on. So um, that's always the case. So we have an abundance of offspring and then the selection kicks in. So the offspring differs in phenotype, so the look and in genotype, which almost always or sometimes, uh, you know, so mm, most likely um, creates a different behavior. This is based on recombination and mutation of the genes. And that is always like an offer to nature. So um, the new offspring just uh, has a go at survival and um, natural selection will kill all the offspring that do not show all the behavior that are needed to survive. So if we have no selection, there'll be no evolution. So that, you know, the individuals that do not show the right combination of genes or the right behavior or the right look are selected is to the benefit of the whole population. For thousands of years, humans did not interfere with these principles in beekeeping. Scabs and lock hives provided almost natural conditions. The natural reproduction, like swarming and mating, was not being uh, manipulated in any way. And only survival of the fittest uh, yeah, made sure that the next generation of offspring was created. There was no interference like adding space or hindering swarms or feeding and so on. Survival of the species is based on the oscillating um, level of offspring and death rate, so the selection. In, in the offspring phase, we have a growth in the population, and then we have the selectional phase. And you know, at, at the end of the day, um, the population will be stable when, um, yeah, when the same amount of uh, offspring is created as it is selected. So only the colonies uh, regarding bees who were adapted to natural uh, demands and local conditions will survive and pass on their new or their genes. We have, regarding the bees, we have multiple selectional processes. So, and we have a lot of open questions. The first selection about the queen, so we don't know which egg is being chosen by the old queen. So what egg does she lie into the cell? Uh, if there are differences, so um, we just don't know. We don't know uh, which queen will be the first to hatch. We don't know why it is the first to hatch. We don't know how the colony is choosing the right queen if the queens are hatching at the same time. And we don't know how they collectively um, decide which queens need to be killed or which queen need to be kept. And um, I've seen in a hive that uh, the colony of the worker bees were chasing uh, the abundance of queens in the hive. So they were after them to kill them. And I was really wondering how do all these bees know which one has to be killed and which one has to be kept. So they need to talk to each other. There must be a sort of communication about that. So we don't know, As science does not know. We don't have any answers for these selection of processes, but we know that they were successful for almost 45 million years. We further don't know how they decide whether they want to accept an abundance of queens or create swarms or, um, 
you know, are they going to kill them? So um, sometimes uh, more than one queen is in the hive because they want to, you know, they want to create swarms, but they can't because of the weather outside. And uh, the situation stays like that for a couple of days so um, that you can find more than one queen in the hive and there is no killing. Why this is the case, we just cannot say. The second selection that we have are the drones. The mating places are usually miles away. Only, only the most vital and strongest air acrobats are getting there and compete with the others, um, uh, you know, regarding the mating. Only the best genes will be transferred and up to 15 different fathers ensure which variety of genetics. This is called faceting. This causes a rich diversity of behavior and abilities. Um, and we can compare that to modern breeding, for instance, when we take only one drone that we choose and we take that, in, you know, that semen or make it an, an artificial insemin insemination. So nothing of that will occur in the new queen. No variety in genetics whatsoever. No selection. It's, it's us who decide. And of course, we do have very different um, criteria that we are looking for. So the faceting and behavior, um, the various different behaviors and abilities are based on the genetics. All what bees do is in, imprinted in their genetic, you know, in their, gen, in their genes. So moreover, the composition and hierarchy must be right. It's not only that the information must be in the genetics, but it's also a hierarchy and um, the triggers that must be ensured that the bees know about them. So genetically, all worker bees can sting. That doesn't mean that they are flying around all day long trying to sting everything they can or everyone. It makes only sense when this behavior is triggered in certain conditions. So. Too much brood, for instance, in a set volume will waste resources and might cause the colony to collapse. So if there is a genetic failure that we, for instance, breed on the bees because we as beekeepers want them to create much brood. So if they are living in a, in a tree cavity, for instance, they create too much brood, then um, it can cause the colony to collapse. Too many bees would trigger swarms. If not, because we have bred on them, for instance, not to swarm, negative effects will kick in like waste of energy or disturbance of the working processes within the colony. We have uh, very vital behaviors like grooming, washboarding or probolizing. Um, that does only make sense when they do it. Uh, when they have storage security. So we know today that these behaviors are naturally subdued to storage security. So they will only, or they will start that behavior, they will start to delouse each other, to groom each other. They will start the washboarding or propolizing when they have storage security. So we have behaviors like late swarms. Of course, that is a genetic failure. Um, if, if there is something like that and it's, it's in a time where they cannot survive. So um, one shouldn't keep that swarm and feed it from the point of view of natural selection. And uh, of course, sometimes we as beekeepers are talking about lazy bees. So I had once a beehive that was considered, or I considered it lazy. I was a beekeeper in these days and it didn't grow. It didn't really uh, take in much harvest or nothing that I could take. And I was wondering about those bees and I was, you know, uh, building a new hive and that was my test colony. And I, you know, had some windows I could look through and I was telling my wife, I said, you know, these are my laziest bees and uh, I'll put them in. So if, if the hive doesn't work, it's, you know, it doesn't matter too much. And she then took a look at these bees and saw that they were grooming each other Ex extensively, so really uh, excessively. I mean, so um, 
they were, you know, literally using all their working capacity or a major part of the working capacity to delouse each other. So they literally had no time for getting intake into the hive and um, they had their intake too, and they were satisfied with that. So they started to uh, turn their behavior to hygienic behavior that uh, allowed them to uh, be untreated towards varroa mites. So this is, you know, this is just an example of uh, what can happen and uh, yeah, how can bees, how bees can react and uh, I think there is no such thing as lazy bees. It's always based on what kind of behavior they are showing in what phase of their lives. And sometimes it's an unwanted behavior for the beekeeper, but it's a very vital behavior for themselves. So the behaviors and the composition that are allowing survival in certain locations uh, for honeybees are mainly unknown to this day. We don't know. So it's like a fine-tuned clockwork. So what do we know then? Well, I've done research in the last years, uh, sitting on the trees, monitoring wild living colonies, using um, very good endoscopes and, um, you know, just uh, watching the biology and the uh, development of the biology in those hives during these years. And there were some things that we could uh, identify then. So, but um, some of these things are already known as the black honeybee adapts its fruit mass to the nectar availability. And um, so the level of fruit must be just right you know, if they want to survive in nature. And of course they can do that because if they, for instance, have too much fruit, it's gonna waste a lot of energy. If there is less nectar availability and they create too much fruit, it can cause the collapse uh, of the colony. And so it doesn't make sense for the bees to create brood anytime and masses of it as we sometimes have as a criteria for breeding on bees. So the level of intake must be right as well. It triggers different behaviors. So too much or little intake is also a selectional factor. So we once, or I monitored another colony who was likely uh, very much buckfast and uh, they moved into a cavity and they, they were you know, creating so much brood that they had so little intake that eventually the whole colony collapsed. Um, didn't, didn't make any sense, right? So, um, um, the storage security and this, you know, the storage itself is going to displace the brood in a cavity. Yeah. So in in the springtime, for instance, when the first intake comes, um, it's it's going to displace the brood field downwards in uh, in the tree cavity, and this is going to trigger grooming behavior. So. I have, um, this is the height that I was talking uh, about uh, that my wife saw with all the bees grooming each other. So um, I've done, you know, that was the first time that I saw that behavior and I, could, I couldn't find, after that for years, I couldn't find another colony showing such an intensive behavior of grooming. And I didn't know why, because I thought, it's like black or white, whether they have the information in their genes, if they have it, they would show it, or um, if they don't have it, they wouldn't show it. So um, I made a scientific research on 100 colonies, we're putting these cloths um, in the draw and uh, we're collecting all the mites. And then uh, we kind of lined them up and uh, you know, just sorted them from being killed by bees or being you know, just uh, died naturally, for instance. We saw a lot of, of these um, pictures here. So they had been killed by the bees. And uh, 
yeah, if you do that uh, for a long period of time, it is having a significant effect even on your health. And uh, yeah, so grooming um, was shown in, you know, by, you know, regarding these 100 colonies, we could only initially find three colonies that showed that intensive grooming behavior. And I didn't know in what hives these colonies were. So I, um, I'm, you know, I always hear someone talking quite loudly. Um, I would just turn down my volume for a sec. So I, um, we could initially find only three colonies out of 100 that were showing that intensive grooming behavior. And I didn't know in what kind of hives these bees were. Um, and I, I called the beekeeper and said to him, because he was sending me the samples and I was telling him, you know, this is uh, colony number, number three, 17 and 21. And he said, you know what's funny? These are the colonies that I'm not taking any harvest. I'm not adding any boxes. I'm, I'm just leaving them. I have them in a small volume. I just want them to swarm to enforce my husbandry. So, and that gave us the other hint. It was like um, the one that I had seen years before that I didn't do any harvest on and that showed the same behavior. So we came to the conclusion by looking at the data that we gained that there's a hierarchy of that behavior. It has to be in the genes, of course, but then there has to be a trigger and the trigger is storage security. So if they have storage security, they will show that behavior. If you add another box, for instance, so if you then um, go to one of these hives and add an, add an empty box on top, they will stop that behavior. So they, you know, the, the grooming rate will drop down from above 70% underneath or around 10% within a few days. Um, Storage security does also trigger propolization. So that is the autoimmune system of the bees. And this is also a selectional factor. So if your hives are not being propolized, that might uh, have something to do with the working capacity, whether you put too many boxes on top or you don't, you don't, you, you don't have um, a roughened surface in the inside because bees always propolize what's rough. So I would always recommend to roughen the surface because there is scientific research that shows that if a hive is living in propolized conditions, um, less pathogens can be found inside the bees, on the bees, and the immune system is running low. So that um, increases the, uh, yeah, the lifespan of the bees and uh, in their health. So intake and condensation uh, triggers washboarding, for instance, and uh, thousands of hours a day, uh, the bees will do washboarding. And of course, uh, that behavior always made us think, what are the bees doing? And we can occasionally see that um, at the outside of the hive, which um, doesn't seem to make any sense. But um, if you then take a look at the inside, and yesterday we took a look at some videos, you will see that in the evening, on that surface where we had condensation, thousands of bees will um, spend hours of uh, hours and hours to uh, wipe the surface dry, and you have ventilation bees that are then uh, you know, uh, just ventilating the humidity out of the entrance hole. So they are doing that to hinder pathogens spreading on the in inner walls, and they will stop that behavior when the coating of propolis is finalized. So they are literally doing that to be, become not infected with uh, deadly pathogens like mold. And that is as well a selectional factor. So if bees cannot do this, or they are not showing that behavior in that manner, uh, they would highly likely be subdued to natural selection in natural conditions. And again, there's, I don't have ever seen a breeding program that um, focuses on bees uh, doing washboarding whatsoever. So the comp building must be correct in nature and sensible. 
and it is as well a selectional factor. So we are talking about selectional factors all the time. So it's 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 always or it's only the most important things that we could find out or that are known from scientific research. So um, the comms are built in a way that will allow them to um, stabilize the climate inside the cavity. If the entrance hole is too high and they would lose too much energy, they will clutch the entrance hole with a comb and they will propolize it very thoroughly because you don't have a condensation here um, because that is the first part where the warm and humid air has contact with the outer and colder surface or atmosphere. And so um, condensation would cause mold spreading. So they propolize it thoroughly so nothing can happen. And uh, all the bees coming in have antibiotic feeds, right? So um, there was one thing that we stumbled across. I'm doing a monitoring with uh, tree cavity simulations. And what we saw there that the highest selectional factor that we found in that program was when the bees did not start building their combs from down, uh, yeah, you start uh, at the roof and build them down, but they started somewhere in the middle or they started building their combs uh, near the entrance hole. And when they are not able to reach the, the top of the hive, they are highly likely to die. They are not going to survive. Um, so we, we lost all of the colonies who were unable to start their uh, comms or the building of the comms at the top. And uh, this is due to, I think, so we are not 100% sure, but you know they will lose the climatic conditions because if they start at the top, so all the gaps between the combs are like pockets and the warm air is standing in these pockets and heating up the uh, storage and the whole thing is working like a radiation system and uh, the combs will uh, provide insulation. So there are a lot of factors that come together. So when they are not able to do this or they are not reaching, even though when they have uh, a very, you know, a, a very large um, comp building and it's, it's reaching down very, very, very much, they are unlikely to survive if they don't start at the top. So uh, what, what are we doing? We are always, you know, uh, placing an empty box on the top. We are getting it off. And so we are playing with that, you know, with that vital part of uh, yeah, um, keeping up the temperature. If they can do that because we are always giving them frames and you know wax sheets, um, they will highly likely lose. So this is one thing that we were discussing about: is did they lose the ability because so many bees or so many colonies that came out of the husbandry system started building the combs in the middle or or close the entrance hole? They didn't reach the top and they were subdued to natural selection. So that made us think. Is that maybe a factor that we see, or is that you know influenced by the fact that we're using frames for decades now and giving them just wax sheets to build on? Because if that if that is not a selectional factor anymore, then uh, the genetic information will of course uh, get weaker and weaker in the genetic pool. So there are a lot of door drops um, in a beehive that are also um, important or a selectional factor. Um, bees have to defense the entrance and of course they have to stabilize the climate. So let's take a look at that. If um, you do have the three dimensional web here and they uh, occasionally clutch the whole entrance, of course they have to defend it. So these bees were all suspicious while I was doing that. And um, that, is, that is of vital importance. So that is another one, um, you know, they didn't, you know, they just didn't let them in, uh, the drones anymore. So they clutched the entrance hole and they blocked them from entering. Um, that was of course in the late summer. There's another one. Um, so they will 
just easily close the entrance hole. When it gets too cold, they do that. When uh, there is a defense situation, they are going to do this. And if they cannot do it because they are sitting in a box, then um, yeah, dramatic side effects will occur and uh, it can end up in a total collapse of the colony because the entrance gaps that we're using in the boxes are way too wide, they're way too huge. In comparison to um, the, you know, the average of entrance gaps or holes that we have in nature, which is a circle of about six centimeters and a surface of about 30 square centimeters, we usually have a gap of two centimeters height and 40 centimeters le uh, length. That means 80 square centimeters, which is you know, more than double the size. Um, and it cannot be defended very well. Imagine you have a house and the whole side is open and you have to defend your house. That's pretty, that's pretty hard to do. And, uh, you know, it's much easier if you were standing just in a door where no one can pass you. Then we have the three dimensional defense web. That is a very interesting feature. The bees are always showing in different countries. Even uh, I've got a picture from a colleague in Great Britain showing me a picture of the bees doing the same. And uh, so they will create that web and you cannot even take glance at the combs. You, you just wouldn't see them, right? And all the bees who are flying in or all the other uh, potential enemies will have to pass that. So even if the, the bees of the same hive are going to fly in these, uh, these paths, um, they are kind of, um, approached by the web. So you can see that the web is reacting to the incoming bees and that they are checked on whether they belong to the hive or they don't. And uh, when I saw that, I, you know, I collected a wasp and I kicked it in and I uh, just looked what, what's going to happen. And you could see that there was one movement. So all the bees are clinging together. There is the communication is unhindered. It's uh, not um, the same picture that we see on the frames where you know the bees on one frame uh, do not know what the bees on the other frame say because they are physically uh, hindered by that. So they are all you know, kind of clinging together like neurons, like cells, like, and there's communication within the whole web. So it takes only one second and there is a shaking or a reaction that you can see, and then uh, the enemy is going to be enclosed in hundreds of bees and cooked to death. And uh, even if it's a hornet or if it's uh, another bee or if it's uh, another wasp, doesn't matter. Even birds are, you know, I, I fight it off. Um, so, uh, well, let me see that. Um, the three-dimensional web has as well uh, some other features. It's stabilizing the climatic conditions on the combs. And of course, all uh, the bees um, will go out of the way for the processes that are you know, taking place on the combs themselves. So the, the next point would be hygienic behavior, such as controlling the microfauna. Um, this is also a selectional factor. Um, we could see chasing and hindering of wax moths. So I can show you a small video of that. Um, this is a colony that we are, you know, doing research on in Bremen, another city, 150 kilometers from here. And uh, yeah, we've just looked inside and take a look at the wall because there are wax moths trying to get on the combs and there are bees uh, just defending them.
Maybe I should go back at 10 seconds to look at it again, uh, because there's one part that I think we have missed right now. Uh, we can see that directly there. You could see that in the corner where the wax moth was chased away. Um, show that again. See that? So they are being chased by the bees to ensure that they are not going or coming close to the combs. So there has to be an awareness. So the, the bees have to uh, control the microfauna. Here you see the same picture. And so these bees are taking care of, of the microfauna. If they don't do it, uh, the combs highly likely get infected. And this can be to the disadvantage of the bees. Doesn't have to be because once we saw that uh, the bees were kind of letting them going on it, you know, letting the wax moth uh, dismantle a comb within the cavity. And when they finished that, they kind of um, fought them off. So they then built a new comb or they then, then would build a new comp. And so they use them as a tool for renewal of comps. Yeah, and of course, um, that is another one. Uh, we looked at a video yesterday where the bees are carrying out the wax moss um, larvae themselves. So uh, another point is the collective intelligence, like you know that you can see when they do ventilation and adjustments to the climatic conditions. There are thousands of bees involved. We have supply bees that will, you know, that will go to the combs, drink some nectar, come down here, feed. This is a supply bee. Feed the ones who are doing the ventilation job so that they don't have to leave their place and go to the combs, that would be inefficient. So they have the, you know, the gasoline bees, yeah? So they, they, they'll do the job and they know who is hungry and who isn't. And then they feed them with, uh, with uh, honey and so they can go on ventilating until the job is done. Of course, um, thousands of bees in the middle will get out of the way to create that airflow space that we have here. And on the outside, you do have uh, as well, 10,000, 15,000 bees just chilling, hanging loose and ensuring that, these, uh, that this work can uh, be unhindered, taking place. Wendy Barrow has said, um, we cannot know what we are doing until we know what nature will be doing if we're doing nothing. And this is exactly what I'm doing. I'm doing nothing. I'm just, you know, doing surveillance. I'm not taking anything out. I just leave them and, you know, do research on the natural behavior and abilities. So man-made breeding and selection, of course, has a totally different goal. So um, we, try to subdue the bees to our demands. And um, yeah, the breeding is, uh, is focusing on behaviors like bells, uh, bees shall not defend themselves against the beekeeper. Of course, we don't want to get sing or stung. Bees shall defend themselves against all other intruders, but not against the beekeeper, of course. Um, yeah, the bees shall sit on the combs when the nest is being dismantled. That's called Wartenstetigkeit in Deutschland, in Germany. So um, they don't like to have these bees flying around their heads. They want them to stay calm on the combs when you know, you're dismantling the whole nest. Bees shall, of course, be quickly in development and they shall create a lot of brood so that it can produce a lot of intake. We shall not propolize too much. It's too sticky on the fingers. So these are all criterias from the breeding book of the German Imker, uh, the Deutsche Imkerbund, German uh, beekeeping organization. And uh, bees shall be eager for intake, of course. So that is a fake emergency situation that we're doing there. If you know, or if you, when you realize that, 
the natural behaviors like grooming, like washboarding and so on are triggered by the fact that the boot field is being displaced by the intake, then you will recognize that if you place boxes on top, um, that vital behavior or that um, behavior of vital importance that ensures you know, survivability in natural conditions is not being triggered anymore or is being let down. So what are we doing when we place empty boxes on top? We are then faking an emergency situation for the bees. They then think they don't have any storage security because the attic is not filled with intake and they will stop that behavior. And, you know, focusing on the intake, of course. And bees shall be res resistant against illnesses but these illnesses are mainly caused by the husbandry system that we have. So we are keeping them in boxes. We have mold spreading in the corners. We have condensation. We have less propolization. Um, yeah, we are keeping them close to the ground. We wouldn't allow them to create a climatic system because all the frames need to be movable. And if they, you know, stick them together with comms, try to repair the climatic conditions, we will um, clear this and uh, make it, you know, uh, movable again. And um, so we are always hindering, uh, yeah, the factors, or we are uh, we are diminishing. Uh, with that uh, kind of hospital system, the health situation of the bees themselves. So, and of course, bee, she um, bee, shell, as a bee shell show a very sensitive hygienic behavior, powers H or power, powers H uh, breeding. So that is what we want uh, regarding their behavior. I, I think there is a lot more, but this is, you know, the main things that we are focusing here in Germany. But there's also another one if we face, we are not only facing on the behavior, we are also facing on the look, right? So um, we do have a breeding regarding the look, the phenotype of the bees. So uh, we are selecting for color, we are selecting for hair lens, we are selecting for the cubital index. And who doesn't know what the cubital index is? It's a fine line in the wing of uh, yeah of the bees, and if they don't have it, we will squeeze the queens because then it does not match our you know our demands of the phenotype. Now, I think you know if you then compare that to the situation that Tom Seeley has described in the Arnold Forest, that is that the bees who have adapted to varroa mites in the Arnold Forest are a bit smaller. They have a smaller diameter of the thorax and the hat. They have a rounded wing shape. They are resistant toward illnesses and varroa, but they would be killed by the Deutschen Imkerbund and some breeders for their look, right? So, because they don't show the right look. And uh, yeah, it doesn't make sense to nature or nor the bees um, or to me, <laughs> man-made breeding and selection again. As long as the main part of the genetic pool was lying in nature's hands, breeding had no impact. So, when we started uh, breeding, like 150 years ago, the main part of the genetic pool of honeybees was in nature. So we all we had. Um, uh, many tree cavities then, and um, so we only had a small portion of the genetic pool of the colonies in common in our hands. And, uh, you know, if the ocean is full of fish and you take some of those out and you put them in a pond or something and you breed them, it doesn't matter to the species because the main part of it is undergoing or subdued to natural selection and uh, so it doesn't affect the stability of the population or the overall behavior of the species. But today, the majority of the genetic pool of honeybees lies in human hands with dramatic effects because beekeeping did not react to this fact until today. We are going on, you know, breeding these criteria that would then um, make it more convenient or convenient to, uh, to get our harvest out, our products. 
So we are facing on criteria that are only um, a benefit to us, but not to the bees. So enforced adaption, like the Fort Knox uh, project that we have in Poland, for example, that is an organization um, of beekeepers who came together and they ensured each other that they wouldn't use any treatment. And uh, so if some of them will lose all of um, his or her hives, then the others will jump in and give him offspring so that they can then enforce a kind of selection on the bees and they will you know, get rid of the treatment of pheromines. So it's, it's, it's called Davinian beekeeping, I think. And um, well, these, these projects are not likely to create bees that can survive in natural conditions because these boxes and the situation in the boxes, on the frames, on wax sheets, on the ground, um, are totally unnatural and they are very different from the ones and the demands of nature in a tree cavity. So if these bees then uh, finally or eventually are surviving um, you know, successfully in the boxes, doesn't mean uh, at all that they are able to survive in natural conditions. Until today, all the necessary behaviors and the composition that will allow survival in a certain location remain absolutely unknown. So science has no idea whatsoever uh, how you know, the combination or the composition of the behaviors must look like to ensure um, that the bees can survive in natural conditions in a certain location, which is very different from location to lo location. So if you, for instant, um, instance, take some bees from John Kefus out of France who are living there treatment free and you, you're getting them to Germany and you're doing some testing on them here, you will recognize that they will likely develop more mice than the other hives that you have here. So it's, it's based on the location. Of course, Spain has a much warmer climate that allows the bees to save a lot of working hours because of the heat. You see here in Germany, the bees uh, in, in the modern hives, the bees need to compensate a lot. And the bees in Spain or southern in Spain, they don't have to do that, right? So, or southern France is it, I think. Um, in that they don't have to do that in that uh, in that manner because the warm um, you know the warm weather there. So they have more working capacity free to focus on behaviors like um, yeah intake and boromite uh, you know elimination. The working capacity of a colony is of course limited. Every behavior that we breed on bees will be paid with the change of the whole composition of behaviors and sometimes even eliminate abilities of vital importance. So an example might be that many bees that we have taken out of the boxes and allowed the swarms to move into tree cavities started to build the combs in a way that wouldn't allow them to survive because they don't start or they didn't start at the top. All human criteria that we breed or enforce on the bees are diminishing their independent surviving abilities and natural conditions. So the question that I would, you know, turn on you is who gives us the right to do that? I've written an article, The True Price of Honey, that I have forwarded to the organizers of uh, the event. And um, I would be happy if, um, yeah, if you ask them to get it, or if you can, you can also write me an email and I will send it to you. So uh, it's 19 pages where I focus on that topic in, in a more you know, closer look or in a you know, wider, scale, wider scale and focus. Yeah, that's it today. Um, thank you very much. Could I ask what recommendations you have um, to help our bees? I don't even know where to start because, you know, what I've done is uh, I have improved boxes for about 10 years of my research. So I was trying to um, I was trying to get more natural conditions in the boxes that what I've done for more than 10 years. So I started with insulation. But if you if you put lightweight insulation on the boxes, doesn't really stabilize the climate. Right. So because there is no heat capacity. 
So we have referred to that in the presentation that I've given yesterday. Um, but uh, you know, you would have to make sure that you use solid insulation, like solid wood, and you really, uh, you know, cover the corners that there is no condensation. That you probably get rid of the frames in the brood in the brood room that you use, and you're not add adding too much space. Or if you add space, then add it, you know, not on the top, but you know, put it uh, from. Uh, yeah, the the downer, you know, the downer part underneath. Put it underneath the the hive, and uh, don't interfere with the atmosphere and the natural combs. And uh, just take a very small part out if you feel that you need to do this. Um, roughen the surface that they do a thorough properization of the hives. Get rid of the entrance gap and use a drill and you know uh, allow them to have a six centimeter diameter entrance hole um, so get them off the ground and um, make sure that they are you know that they are in a shade of a tree or something don't expose them on a roof or on a matter uh, to the weather conditions and you know so all these factors are, are to the benefit of the bees and try to not to operate them, try not to interfere with them, try not to in the swarms. All these things I wouldn't recommend if you are focusing on bee health. So, uh, of course, this, uh, this is a confrontation to what we do usually with the bees uh, to our benefit. But if you, if you really take the health and you know, the benefit of the bees, into your focus, I would then recommend to uh, try to make it as natural as you can. Um, one last sentence, you know, after 10 years that I was, uh, you know, conveying hives or, you know, just uh, improving hives, I learned that I will never get a natural situation in a box. And that is why I literally burned all my boxes. I didn't even want to sell them anymore. and. Uh, I, I, you know, I recreated tree cavities. So we, uh, we have built the first real tree cavity simulation based on the inner climate, climatic conditions and so on. And we have set all, all my bees, I've set them free. And, you know, after five years now, they're still alive, they're healthy, they are vital, they are swarming. I'm not getting any harvest, but uh, occasionally, and, you know, this is um, something that happens every summer. I do have a hive that has harvest and that has died because of natural selection. So I can bring that down and I can then uh, use that honey for my own purpose. So I do have honey, but not in the scale that I was used to before. But I don't have to invest any labor time. I don't have to invest any material so it's, you know, it's absolutely uh, work free. I can go on vacation and I'm pretty unstressed. Um, I just had quite a broad question about how, you know, how are we going to manage to feed, you know, over 7 billion humans projected to be 9 billion by 2050 without relying on highly productive managed livestock? Yeah, I would. I would uh, very much recommend the movie Kiss the Ground for You. Uh, it's about permaculture or regenerative uh, agriculture. And um, so if we do that, we can, we can produce much more feed on much less uh, surface. Uh, we don't have to use any pesticides. We don't have to use any uh, fertilizers whatsoever. So we can get rid of all the problems literally that we have. We would store uh, incredible amounts of, uh, of carbon in the soil. We could even reverse global warming by doing that. And um, we don't have another chance. We don't have another option but doing this. And it's absurd that we're not talking about that matter. So um, uh, if, you, if you're interested in that topic, I would then uh, highly recommend to take a glance at the movie Kiss the Ground on Netflix. And uh, there are a lot of books about permaculture and uh, regenerative uh, agriculture, which is, I think, the only chance that we have to solve the problems that we have at the moment on the planet. And, you know, if you, 
um, if you refer to beekeeping, we do have 8 billion people now on the planet. 70 years ago, when my mother was born, we were only 2.3 billion people on the earth. So never before has the population grown that much of any population of any uh, species in the world. And um, now we ha don't have the capacity to uh, feed 8 billion people with honey. So we don't, we, we're not even able to meet the demands today because about one quarter of the honey on the market is not real honey today. And that is because of the fact that the natural resources do not match with the demands even today. So if it's not sustainable, what we're doing at the moment, and I had a talk or presentation about that yesterday, what's going to happen with the collateral damage on the other insects and the other pollination insects when we go on like that. So if we cannot go on like this because it's not sustainable, then we should stop. We should change our ways, right? So, and that is all, you know, um, very much focused on in the article, The True Price of Honey, which I want to recommend again. Torben, in Germany, there was a conscious decision um, uh, a long time ago um, to completely change the, um, uh, the subspecies in Germany. Um, two questions, really, if you don't mind. Uh, the first is, um, with the benefit of hindsight, was that a good move? And uh, secondly, with your uh, uh, observations and experiments, did a different subs or do you think a different subspecies is behaving differently than the uh, the native one would have done? Uh, this is a topic that almost always comes up, and it has you know there is a lot of discussion about the black bees and uh, the other species that we you know that we have created. And um, I think. And, and this is this is not rude. Please, please, this is not an offense or something. I think this is a racist, waste, racist discussion that we that we are having here. Because the only thing that matters to me is that um, that we do have bees in the wilderness, even in Germany, where we do all the treatments, all the breedings, you know, all the boxes, and we have claimed that there are no such thing as wild, uh, so living countries, uh, um, colonies that are able to survive. And now when I uh, started my research uh, for the first far colony, I was going to southern Germany. I was driving like 800 kilometers. Now I know they are in every forest, so I can find them in any forest here. And uh, I know that they are existing and we do have about 200 of those colonies in the forest. And the only thing that matters to me really is that bees can adapt to natural conditions rather quickly. If you look at uh, the Arnold Forest, it has taken like three years to adapt the species there to natural conditions. So of course, a huge uh, part of the bees who were living there have been subdued to natural selection when Boromite came along. But uh, because of the fact that the, uh, the uh, parental generation always creates an abundance of offspring, so the offspring has occupied, or the survivors has occupied the MP uh, tree cavities. So natural um, or evolution and natural selection is able to cope with these matters. And um, we do have these bees in our forests as well, uh, even though we have a lot of conventional or, you know, 99% conventional beekeeping in Germany, we still have those surviving colonies in the forest. And the only thing that matters to me is if you, if you look at that, if you see that uh, a colony or the genetic pool can adapt to that issue within a matter of a few years, then uh, I feel that the only thing that matters is that we do have the colonies who are able to fulfill their um, evolutionary uh, you know, destiny in the forest here. So they are surviving. They are uh, behaving like you would expect they would behave. I don't have any comparisons to the black bee or to a, uh, you know, to a true black bee um, colony because I, I bought some black bees a few years ago and I, you know, I introduced them into my, uh, you know, regeneration program. I let them swarm and, but, you know, now these bees are not black anymore. So all the bees that I find in the forest are, of course, a mixture of all the genetic lines that we have uh, enforced on the bees. And the nature or nature itself does not, uh, in the case of bees, does not look uh, what color the bees are. So it's, you know, it doesn't care. It only cares about 
all the criteria, all the behavior and uh, uh, that are needed to survive independently in a certain location, uh, let's say in forest. So we do still have these bees being able to cope with all uh, the problems that we have with the industrial land, uh, agriculture, with the pesticides, with, you know, with the small forest parts that we have left and so on. And that is the only thing that really matters to me because the genetic pool must be in the flow always. If it's not in the flow, if we hinder it from flowing, so like we see in the breeding programs for the black bee in order to preserve it, it's like um, preserving the mammoth for me, you know? So um, you cannot preserve the black bee without eliminating all the wild living colonies and getting or, you know, uh, getting or displacing all the beekeepers. So, and both, uh, both things would be impossible. So the only thing, again, that matters to me is that we do have these colonies who are able to cope with the situation that we have today and who does not need uh, any kind of interference, no feeding, no treatment whatsoever, and are, yeah, are, are doing well in the forest. <laughs>